inspiring children to play, smart cars and your health, walking away from a heart attack, and we're going to take a look at bronchodilators in our tip of the week segment this week. If that's what you're looking for, you found it. It's the nursing show. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Nursing Show. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. We have a lot of great information coming up for you, including some very interesting news items regarding healthcare and research, and that'll all be coming up later on in this episode, followed by our tip segment for this week, looking at bronchodilators, all of that coming up here on the show. Before we get into that, I do want to remind you to check out The Nursing Show webpage for additional resources and information about this episode. You can find all of that over at the Nursing Show site, nursingshow.com. You'll find a show notes link at the top of the page. You can click that link and scroll down and find all of the episodes and information you might be looking for. And I urge you to follow up on that so that you understand how what I talked about on the show applies directly to your scope of practice. If you want to get back in touch with me by email, you can reach me here on The Nursing Show at nursingshow at gmail.com. I love to hear from you, and I make sure I respond back to all of your emails. So keep those emails coming in, and I will make sure I get back to you. And maybe I'll even mention your email here on the show. That's it. We'll go ahead and have some more contact information later on in this episode. But before that, let's go ahead and get ready for this week's news. This week's news items all focus on how to be healthier in our everyday lives, both for ourselves and our patients. And we'll start off with a look at making kids more physically active. How do we encourage them to play more physically actively, to play more frequently, and to play longer? Well, it's been looked at that there are different types of playgrounds out there and what type of playground will encourage children to play for longer periods of time. And it was found that playgrounds that had been set up and inspired by natural landscapes were actually better at giving the children opportunities to play, encouraging them to show imagination, and they found that they actually played longer and used more vigorous activities when playing when they had some sort of natural landscaped playground to play in. So tree stumps to jump from stump to stump, um, you know, bridges over streams and rocks and all kinds of fun things to play on that not the structured metal and wood fabricated jungle gyms, but something that has a, a more landscaped approach and a more outdoorsy approach. And I think that this is something that we should pay attention to. You know, we're always looking for ways to get kids more active and encourage them to play outside, not sit down in front of the game or the TV or the computer for the entirety of their day when they're not at school. And if you have a playground that catches their interest, that encourages them to go outside and play, that enables them to be more imaginative and therefore have more fun, well, that's an important way for us to start designing playgrounds in and around our communities. This article comes from medicalnewstoday.com and I urge you to check out the link in the show notes and follow up on this. Maybe there's a way you can improve playgrounds in your community and help kids be healthier. Speaking of making kids healthier, what about if your car could help you be healthier? Well, at the University of Southern California's Body Computing Conference, and recently held at USC, they introduced a Nigel car. Yes, Nigel. It's a Mini Cooper that's outfitted with 230 sensors that enables the car to sense its own well-being, sense information about the surroundings, and sense specific information about the driver, including something is like an ultrasound, um, the ability to sense heart rate. When the patient sits in the car and grabs that steering wheel, 
the car starts gathering data on the patient's vital signs and can track when the patient seems like they might be falling asleep, can uh, track when uh, what the patient's vital signs are and maybe send them an email if their blood pressure has been elevated for a period of time. All of that information can be found just by having this stuff in the car. How much time do we spend in the car every week driving to and from work and running chores and errands? Well, guess what? This car could help you be healthier by giving you more information about what's really going on in your day-to-day -day life behind the scenes in your own body. Pretty cool. And uh, you can find out more information on this. Uh, I got this actually linked over at MedGadget, which always has some cool information and informa uh, interesting health-related technologies. And this one is pretty cool. I'd, I'd like to have a car like that, wouldn't you? Finally, in our healthy news focus this week, a study looked at the effects of brisk walks on cardiac health. And guess what? No surprise, they found that people who engaged in brisk walks actually had a 50% less chance of having a heart attack or a stroke during the study. Now, 10,000 people were followed for 10 years in this study, so it's a pretty good study size and a long tracking point. Uh, and what they found was that it had to be a heart healthy walk, uh, something that we don't always pay attention to. You know, we encourage patients to become more active and hopefully we encourage ourselves to become more active. And one of the things that we say is any activity is good activity. And to a certain extent, that's true, especially in mobility terms, just getting patients up off their fannies and walking around, um, helping them have a workplace where they can stand more frequently. But as far as exercise goes, you need to have vigorous activity of some sort, including a brisk walk. Now, a brisk walk is a walk that elevates your heart rate and uh, leaves you sweating at the end of it. And so if you haven't felt, if you don't feel all warm inside at the end of your walk and sweating a little bit, you probably weren't walking fast enough. So uh, this is important. While the headline of this article may seem like it's a, an obvious statement, what is important here is that there needs to be a certain level of activity to engage in heart healthy exercise. And that activity level is important in the reduction of your risk factors for cardiovascular disease. You can find the links to everything I talk about in these news segments, and I hope you will follow up on the information so that you can better understand uh, the things I've been talking about and rambling on about here on the show. This week's tip of the week, we're going to look at bronchodilators in a segment recorded in a previous episode. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be actually away at a conference, and uh, so I decided to pull some blasts from the past as far as tip files out of the drawer. So in this particular tip segment, uh, which was from about a year and a half ago, we'll be looking at bronchodilators, and I hope you enjoy the tip segment coming right up. So let's talk about what we're going to cover here on bronchodilators. We're going to define bronchodilator. What are we talking about? What medication class is this really dealing with? And what are the bronchodilators? Uh, we'll cover indications. We'll talk a little bit about side effects and general precautions. Again, we're talking about an entire drug class here. So this is going to be an overview of general side effects that are commonly seen with the class. You should refer to each individual medication, of course. Long versus short-acting bronchodilators. There are separate, separate classes within this group of medications. And we'll, of course, cover some specific nursing considerations to consider with these meds and our patients. So what are we talking about with bronchodilators? Well, specifically, as, as the name indicates, they relax and dilate or expand the small reactive airways. We're talking about the bronchioles here. And uh, those small air passages are surrounded by smooth muscle tissue that is uh, responsive to the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And so in response to signals from the uh, autonomic nervous system, these small airways will expand or uh, contract based upon the needs for airway management at the time. And so there are things that can dilate these airways uh, in cases of, for instance, fight or flight response with sympathetic nervous system response. We, medications like this are typically administered via inhaler and nebulizer treatments. 
And that I say typically because there are some classes, some groups of these medications that are injectable, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, and, and so there, it could be sub-Q or IM injections, and in, in some specific cases, um, there are some that may be even administered IV, although that is very rare and, and not usually the case uh, because of the, the strength of the injected forms of these medications. Uh, IV administration may not be necessarily indicated because you want that slow release from an IM or a sub-Q injection. And, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, short-acting or rescue meds most commonly when we talk about the injected forms of these medications and in also in some cases of nebulizers and inhalers. Long-acting medication forms, when we talk about the two, are really talking about maintenance medications. These are drugs that are used to... Uh, maintain bronchodilation over a long period of time, extended release forms of medications that are administered usually in tandem with other meds. And these are the medications that are used to control reactive airway diseases and maintain a, a status quo. And so they're not to be mistaken and used in cases where there is an acute onset of uh, an asthma attack, for instance, or um, periods of constriction associated with emphysema or other problems. What are some of the indications? Uh, we commonly, as I've already said, see this, these medications prescribed for asthma. That is the most common treatment for pediatric patients. Uh, those pediatric asthma patients, uh, when their airways are uh, hyperreactive. And remember that we're talking about uh, that, that heightened immune response, that autoimmune disorder uh, response, where we have an overblown uh, allergic reaction to some harmless uh, substance from the, the, the surrounding environment. Uh, not just triggered by these substances, though, can also uh, be exacerbated and, and set off by uh, periods of anxiety and external uh, stimuli as well. So there are sub several different things that may uh, cause asthma. Also COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These are the uh, emphysema, chronic bronchitis patients that you see um, uh, associated most often with smoking. Uh, long histories of patient smoking have damaged the uh, small airways and the lungs and caused uh, places where uh, they are no longer reacting appropriately. Uh, and so they get uh, gunked up, they get gummed up, or they, uh, in the case of emphysema, those, those air passages are no longer uh, functioning effectively for gas exchange, and uh, so the, the need for uh, further expansion of the available airways is that much more important, and so that may be why that's indicated for COPD patients. Acute bronchitis and pneumonias may also be an indication for some of these uh, rescue inhalers uh, and, and bronchodilators uh, associated with uh, an onset of an upper respiratory or lower respiratory infection, excuse me. Upper respiratory would be the uh, oro and nasopharynx. Uh, lower respiratory would be the uh, bronchi and in the lungs itself. So if you have a situation where there's a, a, an issue, uh, that may be prescribed as well for patients at, of all ages with those problems. Some of the common precautions, when we think about a little bit about what these medications do, uh, they, of course, are always going to have uh, reactions to others. Um, if a patient has had a previous reaction to other similar medications, uh, you are going to want to ask those questions. And uh, obviously, if, if they've had a, a strong reaction to other bronchodilators, you're going to want to really drill in to exactly what they took and what their reaction was to determine if it's safe to administer. And that's the same for every medication, really. Um, patients with cardiac history and arrhythmia, and, and again, think about what these medications do. They are usually beta, uh, beta 2 agonists. They are medications that are going to be focusing on the, the beta 2 effects of the sympathetic nervous system, but there are always some crossover beta 1 effects. And so your beta 2 effects typically are dealing with your airways. However, um, there are also the other beta effects which affect the uh, cardiac rhythm and affect the contractility and the uh, tach induced tach tachycardias. Um, so we're, we're going to change the rate of the heart and everything else. So 
patients with a cardiac history we want to be careful administering these medications because we're going to have some cardiac effect. Now, different versions of bronchodilators have different levels of effect on that beta-1 crossover, but certainly, um, they're, so they're more specific for the respiratory effect, but they're, they all have some effect on um, concurrently on cardiac um, response, and we want to be aware that that could cause an arrhythmia, for, especially for patients with cardiac problems. Patients with a history of hypertension or diabetes, uh, and I think th this is just goes along with the fact that these people are also more likely to have hidden cardiac problems and associated with their 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 uh, issues. Also, if they have hypertension and we cause them to have a cardiac response, we are going to cause them to be more likely to kick a stroke clot loose and have a stroke. Um, there's all these associated problems with hypertension. If we ratchet their blood pressure up even that much higher, it can cause other issues. Elderly and pregnant patients always use uh, caution. Uh, elderly patients are more susceptible to lower doses of these medications. Um, so we want to make sure that we're dosing them appropriately. And it may be indicated to uh, give an elderly patient a, a dose that's, that's smaller than would be considered normal for a, an adult in their prime. Uh, pregnant patients always use caution when giving these meds to pregnant patients. These, uh, these medications are going to easily cross uh, the barrier uh, in the placenta into the, the baby's system. Also, they cause various ver um, forms of vasoconstriction, and uh, we don't want to have vasoconstriction, which restricts delivery of oxygen and blood flow to the placenta and concurrently to the baby. So th there are always going to be concerns about that. And again, remember those crossover effects. There is some peripheral vasoconstriction associated with that sympathetic response, and we're inducing that response to open the airways, but that peripheral vasoconstriction may cause reduced blood flow to the baby, and we need to make sure we are aware of that. Side effects that are commonly seen, and again, I've talked about some of these already, tachycardia, sore throat, and cough, most often associated with the fact that they are inhaling medication, and if they've had an, a recent attack, and they've been doing using their inhalers uh, frequently, uh, it's possible that they've irritated their throat getting all these medications down uh, into their lungs. So they may in have induced a sore throat or cough associated with that. Dizziness and headache also can be seen. And uh, because of the side effects of these medications, it's often indicated that uh, patients in, in your education to them, they should be aware that they should take these medications cautiously and not use any heavy equipment or drive a car, for instance, until they have an idea of how this affects them. Because a sudden bout of dizziness after taking a med while you're driving could cause you, of course, to have problems driving straight, and we don't want to have that. So that's always an important part of the patient education process. They may also experience anxiety, restlessness, or insomnia. Again, this goes along with that sympathetic side effect, and then we're, we're ratcheting up their fight or flight, uh, their fight or flight uh, system, and because we're doing that, we're ratcheting up everything that goes along with it. And so they're they're. If you've ever seen anyone in the midst of uh, an asthma attack after multiple albuterol treatments and they are just climbing the walls there and, and, and think about it, they, at the same time, they're having trouble breathing, which also causes significant anxiety. So it's a, it's a, it can be a cascading effect. So calming a patient down and keeping them calm and keeping the environment around them calm is very important. Uh, anything we can do to ratchet down the anxiety will help uh, offset some of these side effects that are going to commonly happen with uh, most of the uh, more common beta agonists that are out there. Patient may experience nausea, and uh, this is associated, again, sympathetic response. We're shunting blood away from the uh, GI tract and getting it to the vital organs and to the muscles for that fight-or-flight response. And again, this can also cause uh, you know, some feelings of nausea as the GI tract ceases to have the ability to, um, to, to deal effectively with the food that may be still in the system, and so you have that feeling of nausea. Adrenergic overdose, I mentioned this here, uh, just because it, it can happen. If uh, somebody has taken uh, way too much of their, their uh, bronchodilators, they may have overloaded and, and caused an, an overblown adrenergic response. And it's just important to be aware that this could happen uh, with your patients. And uh, again, we would see basically the side effects already listed in, in spades. Uh, we're just going to see a lot more uh, severe side effects, and in, in including severe arrhythmias, uh, 
associated uh, tachycardias, or in fact, we may even see cardiac arrest occur. Uh, so a lot of things can, can happen as a result of, of too many of these medications in the system. But I, I, I th- you know, it's, it's frequently uh, pretty, pretty rare, and usually when you're administering these medications, uh, they're, you're monitoring them carefully, you're watching their response, and, and we're only titrating our, their dosing and our uh, administration of these medications to uh, the response we get to open the airways up. Short versus long acting. Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, we talked kind of briefly about the fact that your, your short acting are your rescue drugs. These are for an acute onset of an attack of some sort, uh, shortness of breath associated with asthma, for instance, uh, an onset of an asthma attack. That short acting drug is going to open up the airways because remember, we're, what they're doing is they're actually trapping air. They're able to get air in but then the constricted airways, uh, as they try to exhale, uh, some of the, medica- uh, the, um, the air is being trapped into the lungs. So they're actually unable to exhale to bring in fresh air to replace the deoxygenated air that's in their system. Short-acting rescue drugs will help to open those air passages, and that's what they are. Typically, inhalers, nebulizers, and, and some of the common medications, albuterol, metapaternal, Z- um, Zopinex, um, and a combivant. And combivant is actually a combination of albuterol and a, um, an anticholinergic medication to have a combined uh, prolonged effect uh, beyond just the initial effect of the albuterol in the system and delivering that, that um that anticholinergic medication is going to help dry things up a little bit and hopefully have a positive response in getting um, the, getting the airways opened in that respect. Also, uh, we have injectable short-acting rescue drugs that include medications like terbutaline or epinephrine. Um, and these are considered, uh, you know, if patients are refractory to albuterol uh, common, or their common nebulizer treatments, inhaler treatments, and uh, they're having a bad uh, response, you may want to ask them some questions about their history and find out that, yeah, the last time the albuterol wasn't working and they gave me an injection. And yeah, typically the first line would be terbutaline. Uh, epinephrine is like the ultimate beta agonist. It's also an alpha agonist. It's, it's you know, it's adrenaline. And we don't want to jump right to epinephrine epinephrine except in the most severe cases after everything else has failed. So, but that is an indication, you know, that is a a, a type of injectable uh, bronchodilator. Long-acting are maintenance drugs, as I said, and uh, typically we're talking about medications with up to 12 hours of action. So a patient would take this once or twice a day and would use it to maintain open airways and air passages, um, staving off any attacks that might be lurking underneath, hopefully, by having the appropriate dose and maintaining through uh, appropriate management through their medications and other ways that they manage their uh, their response to their disease. Uh, this is again up to 12 hour action and we're looking at uh, formoterol and salmeterol and these are um, often coupled with inhaled steroid medications. So these are almost always combination medications. Again, the, the inhaled steroids have the prolonged anti-inflammatory effect to counteract that overblown allergic reaction we we're seeing in an, in an asthma attack. And also in the case of these long acting uh, bronchodilators uh, coupled with them, it, makes, it seems to make a good package. Now, I will say there's been some uh, alerts that have been put out via the FDA on some of these long-acting uh, beta agonist medications associated with cardiac outcomes. And I just want to point out that you should make sure you're following all the uh, labeling and making sure you're aware of any up-to-date uh, precautions or concerns that may be associated with a given med, so you know what else to look for. And again, this is a general review of a drug class and not a specific medication, so you should definitely make sure you're aware of that and talk to your patients and educate them on what to watch for. What are some of our key nursing considerations? We talked about education, of course, but really it comes down to a couple of things very importantly up front. It's getting a good medical history. If you have a patient coming in with an acute uh, respiratory distress episode associated with a reactive airway disease or with asthma, you want to get a good medical history on these patients. What do they have going on? How long has they been diagnosed? What specifically is causing the problem? Is it asthma? Is it bronchitis? Is it related to an acute episode or is it related to a long-term problem? 
Assess their vital signs and reassure your patients. Again, we want to maintain and manage anxiety levels. In many cases, especially in asthma patients, they've already taken the requisite dosing of their rescue meds and they didn't work. And they were told to then present themselves to some healthcare resource, whether it's an ambulance, an emergency department, the primary care physician's office, whatever the case may be. Reassuring and, and helping with the anxiety associated with any respiratory distress episode, along with the ramped up anxiety associated with bronchodilators, is going to help to uh, keep that patient calmer and, and hopefully stave off some of those side effects. Monitor the medication for effectiveness and be ready to respond at the next level if they are ineffective. These situations can situations can rapidly progress and go downhill fast. And I've seen asthma attacks that just are not responding to anything. And it, you need to recognize that there is no improvement very quickly and decide whether or not they need to move on to another line of, of response, whether it's amping up to a different medication for that rescue med, med or going to some of the injectable forms. Are we going go to are we gonna go and give them epi? Uh, we need to know that. And so you need to be able to monitor them very carefully and, and assess the patient. Uh, listen to lung sounds. You're really going to need to... to brush up on your lung sounds and understand, listen for, are there fields clear? Uh, you're going to find those trapped areas where pockets of air are being trapped in those asthma patients. And as those airways open up, as if you're having a positive response, you should be able to start hearing air moving in more areas of the lung. And so a careful baseline assessment is important to make sure you, you understand what's going on. An important question to ask with any of these patients in the asthma attack, I always think, is what happened the last time? If they've had an attack like this before, ask the patient or a family member, when the last time this happened, what occurred? Because if you find out that the last two times this happened, the patient has been admitted, intubated, and ended up in the ICU for three days, guess what? <laughs> you need to be ready for that. It, 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 it is sometimes better to be prepared and maybe you can get ahead of it, but if you can't, being more prepared to, to, to move to the next step, as we said earlier, if it's ineffective, if earlier treatments are ineffective, is going to help this patient in the long run. So be prepared for what might happen. And in this case, medical history is very important because if they've been intubated before as an asthma patient because of a severe attack, it's likely that they will be intubated again. Um, Think about CPAP and other things that may be able to help these patients. Uh, and so you have respiratory therapy in a hospital situation. If you're working as a nurse in a pre-hospital environment, a lot of ambulances or maybe physician's offices even may have a CPAP machine that may help to maintain those open airways. Again, that in additional positive pressure in the whole airway system can push back against some of that the constriction in the small air passages and may be able to maintain those lungs open a little bit longer. Really the key for a lot of these patients is maintenance and control prior to the acute attack. So if you have a patient that's had an acute attack, it's really important to put them in touch with a resource, either a, a nurse trained to educate patients on how to better manage their asthma or in, in situations where they can go and talk to a pulmonary specialist about some different things they can do uh, to avoid whatever set off this particular episode. And there are almost always triggers, either emotional triggers or environmental triggers, and we can identify those things. We can try to avoid them and hopefully not have a similar attack in the future. And so that's really why education is so important and why it's really the nurse's job to stay on top of this and, and be educators for the patients and their family members when these things happen. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Nursing Show. I want to remind all of you to follow up on all of the information you'll find over at the Nursing Show website, and that's nursingshow.com. You can follow up on the show notes links there at the top of the page. Check out the links to the news items. Check out the links to the additional resources from the tip of the week. All of that information can be found over there at nursingshow.com. If you want to get back in touch with me, I urge you to do so. You can reach me by email by sending those emails in to nursingshow at gmail.com. I respond back to all the emails that come in, so keep on sending those comments, those suggestions, those questions for me here. 
If you want to follow up with me on Twitter or Facebook, you can find me there under the handle podmedic. So twitter.com slash podmedic or facebook.com slash podmedic. And become a fan now of The Nursing Show on Facebook. We're fast approaching 1,500 members over there. And if you want to be one of those first 1,500, get over to facebook.com slash nursing show and become an official fan of The Nursing Show on Facebook. You can click the like button right there on the page and then follow and check out the information, links, and resources that get posted throughout the course of each week that I don't always get out and uh, put on the show. So you can find the additional questions that I ask the community and ask questions yourself all over on the Nursing Show fan page. That's it for me. I'm gonna go ahead and close out the show. If you wanna catch more, there'll be another episode coming out next Friday, every Friday here for the Nursing Show. I'm Jamie Davis, your host, and I want you to please remember to stay safe and stay tuned here to The Nursing Show. Take care.